uh, G, also our viewers would be very interested in understanding from the CEO himself that how do you see the next 12 months, the, the, the story evolving and the research approvals, how the roadmap looks like? Okay, well, I'll take out my crystal ball. So obviously uh, <laughs> in an operational world, the patients come into trials and you know it ha what happens happens, but we plan. Yeah. Um, based on our plans, uh, obviously, uh, I'll start with the inhalation, so the quick sleeve, the one that I know everybody's really anxious to hear. Um, so we announced we were going to be increasing the enrollment in our trial. And, you know, for us, that one of the things that had slowed down our clinical operations was COVID uh, in basically here in the United States. And the reason for that is... Uh, the, a lot of the hospitals in the United States were obviously focused on patients uh, that were sick, say, with COVID and, and not necessarily cancer pain. So now that COVID is under control because of the great job of the vaccination, uh, the physicians now have time to kind of refer patients to clinical trials. Yeah. So now we can put more money basically on that and begin to accelerate the enrollment of plenitude. So that's one of the things you'll start to see uh, coming up in the next, let's say, three months uh, is news related to what's going on in the trial. Mm -hmm. On the reborn trial, the one against morphine, where we have a single site, so obviously our, our plans, it's an open label, so we get to see the results as patients come in. Obviously, we can't talk about it ethically because the regulators don't allow us to, but internally, we do see it. Okay. So you can imagine that you know, obviously at one point the company will see data and decide, okay, we need to accelerate this trial. And that's going to be, you know, obviously important because uh, like I said, if you have a drug against morphine, uh, as soon as we start to see data that's very positive, then things are going to begin to change. Mm -hmm. The moment we reach the interim, then obviously we'll have to decide, do we release this news or not? That's going to be a decision with the uh, my team at the board that we can basically uh, do we reveal this uh, or do we continue to basically sit on the news until the end of the trial type of thing and that's that's typical in pharma we have to decide that sort of thing we have to be careful because there are securities regulations that may say okay we have no choice but to reveal something uh, depending on the nature say of, of the event yeah. On the immunomodulator front, I think that too is going to be a big game changer. And the reason I say that is for over 20 years, the big pharmaceutical companies have been studying cannabinoid molecules and other small molecules that interact with the CD2 receptor. A lot of these drugs have failed in human trials, the phase one, the safety, because of side effects on the brain, basically, uh, that people had... Uh, on intolerable neurological side effects. Ours is a very selective drug for this receptor, and it's a derivative of CBD. Well, CBD is very well tolerated. Everybody, we know it. So we're very optimistic that our trial results are actually gonna be very positive and they're gonna show that this drug is tolerable. And that to me is gonna be a big changer because big pharma is gonna say, hey, wait a second, these guys have a patented drug that's been <clears throat> patents granted in Europe, the States, Australia now as well. And they have this immunomodulator that does not have what killed our other drugs. That no. to me is going to be a big game changer from a pharma point of view, because they're going to say, wait a second, these guys might actually take the market with this cannabinoid into the immunomodulator markets. So that's basically my crystal ball. Perfect, perfect. No, we are very optimistic and I'm very happy to see your optimism and uh, would be also uh, jumping in uh, these kind of calls with you and interviews with you over the course of a uh, couple of months. Uh, before I go to the conclusion summary part of our, of our interview, uh, a lot of uh, viewers would be very interested and curious because you know better than anyone that cannabis itself has a very a, some bad image as well around the world with their banning regulations so how would in a layman terms would you explain the cannabis and the cannabinoid drive drugs from that so how would you describe that there's a difference and it's not the cannabis which many people think of well, I, I actually, to bring that question, it's an interesting question. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll actually get a bit more personal into this answer. 
<clears throat> many years ago, I was working with a Belgium company okay. <clears throat> and I had uh, developed basically a disc hernia. And one of the people in the company was actually a professor of herbal medicine uh, in Belgium, very well respected uh, clinical uh, physician treating patients with herbal medicine for over 24 years. Back then, that was in, I guess, the early 2000s. I didn't believe in, in let's say, phytomedicine. That was a pure pharma, had been developing back then for, you know, uh, over 15 years, drugs as a PhD in, you know, pharmacology, toxicology, and you would have talked to me about certain, you know, natural things, and I would have said, oh, yeah. God, <clears throat> leave me alone, and I, I was on multiple narcotics, but I had to come to a meeting in Europe, and I had emailed to this uh, clinician, and I couldn't work because of the narcotics, but, so I was either in pain or taking these opioids and then being kind of brain numb. And I he couldn't even lift my suitcase in the airplane. Wow. Somebody had to help me put it uh, above my head so I could sit down. And the vice president of the pharma came with me to this meeting. <clears throat> and we showed up and he said, there'll be a little bag for you at the hotel waiting. Just make a herbal tea, take yeah. it, and I'll see you the next morning. And in my mind, I was like, well, I've got nothing to lose. I'll try this herbal tea. And I can tell you, it was a game changer for me because when I showed up at the meeting, the vice president looked at me and says, you're carrying your luggage. I said, yes, I took whatever this plant mix is and I didn't need to take my opioids. Wow. And that to me opened my eyes to a new world, which was herbal medicine. So after that, obviously I went and decided to study these plants, but that was my introduction to herbal medicine as a PhD. And since then I teach herbal medicine today, as you can imagine, it's stimulated and I have uh, multiple uh, patents uh, that were are based on, on herbal medicine. So when you talk to me about cannabis, cannabis to me is just another plant. Yeah. And there are many plants that have uh, ingredients that cause, how could I say, psychoactive side effects. Cannabis is not the only one, but many of these plants have a potential, how can I say, to, to cure many diseases. We just need to study them. And pharma has always studied plants. It's not that pharma has them. That's how I got into that meeting. It was, you know, they had consultants that were herbal specialists and pharmas have always been looking for the next, let's say, blockbuster molecule. But these molecules, I tell my students when I teach, Humans have never actually created from scratch a molecule that was successful. We've, how can I say, modified phytomolecules to make them into a successful drug. And that's, to me, that's what cannabis is. It's a source of molecules. We're looking at them. Uh, historically, cannabis has been used to treat, you know, diseases for over 4,000 years. Well, I know some plants from Europe that have been use that long that are not yet in medicine that, you know, people are studying it and, and that. So to me, it's a source of molecules. It has a potential, but we also have to learn from it. Yeah. Cannabis back 2000 years ago was inhaled. And that's the path Tetra is taking today. We are sticking to the traditional way the plant was, how can I say, delivered to the body. And we see that when you take CBD orally, it's metabolized. So you're getting metabolites at high levels that were never people were never taking uh, before. And if you look at the European philosophy for, say, natural products out there, they want at least 100 years on the territory of traditional use. Well, you don't have that by the oral route for cannabis. It was inhaled. So that's, that's my opinion on cannabis. I think it's just another plant that's going to bring us, uh, in this case, and our, my belief is will bring us an alternative to opioids. That's but amazing. by inhalation. Amazing. Uh, so Guy, coming to the conclusion now, and as you have mentioned in, in depth, the team, what the company is doing, what the future looks like, and giving us a very good overview of uh, how to differentiate between cannabis and the history of it. Imagine yourself that you're an investor here in Europe or Germany, maybe, and not much uh, familiar with the research with cannabis. What would trigger you to go and take a deep dive in Tetra Biopharma, uh, check the stock, and what would be your key points? Okay, good question. 
would be would be <clears throat> vital for an investor to understand. I would tell you to go track down some of the first uh, scientific evaluation reports that were published. Back then, it was by Paradigm Capital. They mm -hmm. had us at a dollar seventy-five based on two of our products for the Canadian market only, not the U.S. market. Look at our price today; very, very low compared to that. So, I, I can tell you, I, I don't even believe a dollar seventy-five was appropriate back there. I, I thought that was too low. I certainly still think that's very low for our company today. But look at where we are; we're trading somewhere in the low thirty uh, Canadian dollars. Uh, uh, 30 cents in terms of Canadian dollars, uh, very low, so very undervalued. But look at the potential of our drug. We've been at it for six years, so we're not new. We've had over four clinical trials. Take a look at GW Pharma, where it was just before it got Sativex approved in the UK the first time, and you'll be shocked to the, to the difference. So if you look at that, the potential, the fact that the FDA is basically behind us because it's approving our trials. We're dealing with plans to commercialize these drugs in Europe. So we're pretty advanced. Um, we have granted US patents. So one thing that people always forget is uh, basically the freedom to operate. So we, you know, we're basically alone in our field and we have <clears throat> patents. So that's one thing I would look at, uh, basically the, the value and the opportunity. If we do beat morphine, that's going to change. It's going to change a lot of people with pain. And it's, you know, millions of, of people in Europe that are suffering from chronic pain that are going to see this new drug coming. And that's going to change, especially as a public company. People will be interested in the drug. So have a look at the, our achievements. Have a look at, you know, what the analysts have said in the past and our share price being low. And also look at what I just said about the immunomodulator. 12 years of research in sepsis, find another biotech that's been around for 12 years studying sepsis that's ready. People say, okay, but you guys are late at the COVID race. I'd say as a drug developer, been doing this for over 25 years, I'm not late. I have a new molecule. It's never been in humans before. I have yeah. to do it cautiously because imagine, again, I spend $10 million and I go so fast that I hit a brick wall. I've done no favor for shareholders. One thing is for sure, all the failures of clinical trials with COVID, we learn. We learn what endpoints didn't work, what endpoints work, and obviously, did they position the drug appropriately or not? <clears throat> so these are things you'll see, and you'll discover recently with the George Mason University that came out and did a news release, and that's independent research. Uh, from a very credible, you know, uh, institution that's involved with the National Institute of Health, where yeah. they studied our drug and found it also has antiviral properties. I would add all that up, and I would say, my God, that is undervalued. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you so, so much for giving us your time, giving us all the insights. So we will be surely looking forward to catching up with you in a couple of months to see how the story evolved and uh, what are the new updates. Welcome.